Good morning. God is good. All the time. We welcome you to New Bethel this morning as well as in person and online. Please center yourself as we listen to our prelude. Please rise for hymn 206, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. Lord Jesus. 
once the praise we shall know the joy of Jesus in him there is no darkness at all the night and the day are both alike the Lamb is the light of the city of God shine in my heart Lord Jesus Amen Thy will not hurt or destroy on all my mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. We are followers of that root of Jesse, of which Isaiah spoke. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world, to all of creation, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, and bear forth and bear fruit worthy of repentance. We light these candles, the candle of joyful hope and the candle of proclaimed peace, in part to remind ourselves that we are a people rising toward God's promise. But we also light them as a sign to the world, an announcement there are some who hold on to hope and there are some who work the ways of peace. We stand as a sign that Emmanuel, God with us, is still our fervent prayer. Please join me in hallelujah, a hallelujah Christmas. I've heard about this baby boy who comes to bring us joy. And I just want to sing this song to you. Goes like this the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall. With every breath, I'm singing. Expecting child, they reached the inn. It find a place for you who was coming soon. There was no room for them to stay, so in a manger filled with hay, the God's only Son was born. Oh, hallelujah! Hallelujah!
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. All right. First Sunday in December, second Sunday of Advent. I'm feeling a little expectation and excitement. You feel it? Oh, it's a great Sunday. It's a great day the Lord has made. Hey, next Sunday, we've decided we're going to have a little ugly sweater contest. So next Sunday, wear your ugliest Christmas sweater to worship, and we'll have a little contest. We'll have three prizes to give out. Ugliest, loudest, most spastic, whatever you want. Just Christmas sweater, and uh, we'll have a little uh, contest next week. Um, We also want to remind you that we are sponsoring one family for Christmas uh, this year. It's a family that we actually, we met through our Trunk or Treat event. And they asked if we did anything to help with Christmas, and we said, yes, we do. We have a little angel tree. So we have a mother and two children, and we're going to help them with some Christmas gifts. The way we do this, there's an angel tree in the lobby. It's got angels all over it. Some of the angels are made of paper. Take a paper angel. Okay, don't take the ornaments. Take a paper angel. And on that paper angel is written um, the child, the child's age, and what we're asking you to purchase. So if you'd like to do that, it might be a toy, it might be a pair of pants, it might be a shirt, it might be a pair of shoes. But take those angels, um, just one per family if you don't mind, because we're just doing one family, so we don't have a lot of angels uh, to shop for. But uh, just ask you to do that, and then all the gifts are due back at the church by December 18th, and the family will pick the gifts up. So thank you for that help. Let us come before the Lord now in uh, a time of prayer. Advent is a wonderful season of expectation. It's a season of waiting. It's a season, like every season of the year, a season of prayer. And so we come before the Lord, and we bring our desires. We bring our um, hurts. We bring our requests. We bring whatever's on our heart, whatever's going on with us, and we bring it to the Lord. And we say, Lord, help us. Um, Lord, guide us. Lord, direct us. Lord, um, renew us and and bless us and help us. And so you're invited during this time of prayer just to come into the presence of the Lord. He is here with us. He is here with us. Jesus is receiving our worship this morning. He is receiving your prayers. Let's come and talk to Jesus. gracious and loving God, we gather here this morning in obedience to the scripture, for you have taught us that corporate worship is important. We can worship you anytime and any place. We can worship you in our cars. We can worship you out in nature. We can worship you at home or at school or at work. But Lord, you've taught us that it's important to come together um, from time to time and and to remember the Sabbath, the, the Sunday, to keep it holy, to remember that there are six days you have given us for work and you ask one day in seven that we rest. And, and it's good for us, God. It's good for us physically. It's good for us spiritually. It's good for us emotionally because on that day of Sabbath rest, we can kind of turn over to you everything that's on our hearts, everything that's been occupying our thoughts, everything that we've been worrying about, and we can just lay it at the foot of the cross and let you handle it. Lord, we thank you for this gift of Sabbath. We thank you for rest. And as we approach the Christmas day, the celebration of your birthday, Lord, make us mindful to notice the people around us that need our help. Help us to notice the people around us that have been a blessing to us, and maybe we give them a thank you. Um, Lord, help us to serve you well in this world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we would ask the ushers to wait upon us for the morning offering. We, uh, again, thank you for your offerings. Um, They go to support the ministries of the church. They pay the salaries of the staff, and they do a lot of uh, mission work. Um, And they keep the lights running 
and, you know, all that good stuff. But you've been very generous this year. We appreciate that. Um, it's been good. And I, I credit that. I've said this a number of times this year. I credit that to your generosity. And thank you online. I know you all support us as well. But I also credit it to the grace of God. I think that God blesses those churches that are doing what God has called them to do. And I feel like New Bethel is doing that. And I commend you for it. I thank you for it. And just keep sharing Christ. Keep pointing people to Jesus. Amen? Do it in any way you can think of. Just keep doing it. Let's pray over the offering. God, thank you for the opportunity, for the privilege of being able to contribute. It, it, the price, uh, the cost, the amount, that doesn't really matter. Lord, we, we put in what we can. Um, perhaps we're tithers. We put in 10%. But Lord, whatever we put in, we, we offer to you and to your service, and we do it joyfully. We do it with happy hearts. We do it in the knowledge that you will use what we offer, and you will use it to build your kingdom. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy This child was born as a gift from heaven, a gift from God sent to save the world. The angels sang a choir shone around them. Glory to God and peace on earth to men. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The shepherds came on that glorious evening. They came to see the child sent down from God. They knelt and worshipped in that lowly manger. The, the promised gift of the Messiah come. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my 
soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i'll worship your holy name and lord today i give all my worship i give my life as an offering for you are worthy of all praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more bless the lord oh my soul his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i'll worship your holy name worship your holy name god i'll worship your holy Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, I'll worship, worship your holy name, God, I'll worship your holy Have you ever uh, gone through something that was so unpleasant, so bad, you just, uh, you just didn't envision how you were going to ever recover from that? We begin this second Sunday of Advent with the writings of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. And it was such a time as that, it was like that in their lives. Uh, the Jewish people, they had been exiled from their homeland. They had been conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar. And they had been taken against their will um, to Babylon, a foreign place, a city. They didn't know anyone. They didn't know the culture. They were prisoners at first. As they left Jerusalem, they could see the smoke rising from the ruins of their beloved home. They felt as if they'd lost everything. Um, they would even write a psalm that talks about losing their God as well. It was devastating. When we come to Isaiah chapter 40, uh, over 40 years have passed. And things are a little bit better. Uh, they've been in exile now over 40 years. A new generation has been born. Uh, many of those people have been born in Babylon. Very few of them are prisoners anymore. They have been... Uh, acclimated, absorbed into the Babylonian culture and economy. So they've kind of made a place for themselves. They've been allowed to um, not only exist, but some of them have thrived. And then these words come from God through the prophet. And I want you to listen to this beautiful passage from the 40th chapter of Isaiah. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her, that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord 
has spoken. God tells the prophet Isaiah that it's time now to speak tenderly to the people. They have been through a lot, and it's finally time for words of comfort and encouragement. Their situation has not escaped God's notice, nor has God forgotten about them. Like we talked about last Sunday, you and I are never lost in the crowd. God sees us. God saw them, and it was time for comfort and renewal. Um, Switch over to uh, the end of that same chapter, Isaiah 40, and um, we're going to start with verse 28. Again, uh, these are very famous uh, verses. I I hope they're familiar to you. If they're new to you, just, just listen and imagine the prophet Isaiah sharing this with the people. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. God gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. That would sound like good news, wouldn't it? Even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall what? Shall renew their strength. Isn't that beautiful? Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah is reminding them of who God is as if they've forgotten or gotten so worn down by adversity that their member, their memory of walking with God in favor has faded. That happens to us sometimes, doesn't it? We, we experience a season where we, we feel God's love and things are going good in our lives and we know that, that all is right. And, and God is pleased with us. And then we experience other seasons of adversity and we feel like God has forgotten us. And sometimes even the memory of having been uh, once upon a time walking in God's favor, that memory fades. And we can't remember what it was like to be happy. If you've never experienced that, I'm, I'm glad. But some people have, you know. You, just, you can't remember what it was like when things were better. Sometimes we forget who God is. And and Isaiah reminds them who God is. Even the strongest and best Christians among us get tired at times. But Isaiah reminds them that God's power and strength never diminish. God is never too tired to help or too busy to listen. His strength doesn't fade and God's love never fails. God is never too far away and God never shows up too late. Can I get an amen? His understanding may be unsearchable, but God knows us and loves us and calls us by name. And if God can calm a raging sea, then God can calm the storm in me and the storm in you. When we are overwhelmed and we start to break, God gives power to the faint and he strengthens us. Isaiah says that those who know this and trust in the Lord are actually refreshed. They are renewed. Their strength renewed by God's inexhaustible supply of strength and grace and goodness. You see, God never runs out of fill in the blank, okay, anything. God never runs out of grace. He never runs out of forgiveness. He never runs out of mercy. He never runs out of love. He never runs out of goodness. This passage is a beautiful promise from the Lord, and it's one that we need to hear that we need to absorb this morning and take to heart, and then we need to share it. There are so many today who feel overwhelmed. They have lost strength, and they're feeling faint. And we need to stand as a signal to them that all is not lost. God is with us. There is hope and peace and love and joy in our future. But the world situation doesn't always seem that optimistic, does it? I mean, we can stand up, we can be filled with hope and offer encouragement to others, but honestly, we wonder at times, does that really work in the real world? Can we really help anybody or affect any change? Does faithfulness really matter? 
I would say to you a resounding yes. <laughs> um, the Old Testament prophets would say to you a resounding yes. Jesus certainly lived like it mattered. The early church folks lived as if it mattered, as if their faith could actually bring about change in the world, as if their light could shine to others and point them to Christ. They lived that way. My grandparents lived that way. You and I are called to live that way. Many years ago, one of the families in our church, the church I was pastoring, experienced a fire. Um, have you ever experienced a house fire? I hope not, but if you've ever experienced one, it is, it is so hard. It is so tragic. Um, my friend's beautiful home burned to the ground one winter. It was truly devastating. They were not injured in the fire. They got out. Um, we were very thankful for that blessing, but they lost everything they possessed, including their cars in the garage. It was so sad. And, of course, the church rallied around them with support and love and lots of gifts, uh, financial gifts, gift cards. And when the time was right, a new Bible. When the time was right. <laughs> you know, um, as a younger pastor, I didn't fully grasp the importance of timing. Um, you have to learn that, you know. It is a good thing to speak of God's plan and how God is at work in our lives, numbering our days, but not in that moment where the person you're with has lost their husband or their wife. That's just not the moment. It is important to speak of the wrath and the anger and the judgment of God against sin, but not at the funeral of a person whose family doesn't even know God. Timing is important. For everything there is a season, right? Some years after my friends had their fire, um, Jason Gray wrote an amazing song, and it immediately called to my mind their house fire. It could have been written for them. It so gently and poignantly captured the agony and the pain of that experience. Do you know this song? It's called Not Right Now. Have you ever heard this one? You could see the smoke from a mile away. He's writing about a house fire. Trouble always draws a crowd. They want to tell me that it'll be okay, but that's not what I need right now. Not while my house is burning down. Timing is important. He sings the chorus. Um, it's a beautiful chorus. He says, I know someday, I know somehow I'll be okay, but not right now. <laughs> we say amen, not right now, not in that moment. You can't even see a future. Tell me if the hope that you know is true ever feels like a lie, even from a friend. When their words are salt in an open wound and they just can't seem to understand that you haven't even stopped the bleeding yet. You know, timing. He's echoing what so many of us know to be true through our own difficult experience experiences, yes, someday things will be okay. Somehow we'll make it through, but not right now. Give me a minute to grieve, right? Give me a minute to experience this trauma and this loss. And then in time, I'll be ready for the pep talk. Don't tell me when I'm grieving that this happened for a reason. People mean well when they say that. It does not help in the moment. Maybe one day we'll talk about the dreams that had to die for new ones to come alive, but not right now. Not right now. When someone has lost a child, it is not the time to tell them that everything happens for a reason or that God needed their little one in heaven or not to, not to be so distraught you can have more children. That's a horrible thing to say. No, somebody actually said that a well-intentioned friend trying to help someone. That is not the time. Not in the tragic moment. And our feeble attempts to comfort can just keep on more pain. I have found many times in ministry, in my life, in my experiences, that it is far better to just be present and be quiet. 
words don't help in every moment of our life, you know? And then he sings, uh, Jason sings one more verse, and I think it's the best verse in the whole song, honestly. He says, while I wait for the smoke to clear, you don't even have to speak. Just sit with me in the ashes here, and together we can pray for peace to the one acquainted with our grief. Isn't that profound? Just sit with me in the ashes here, and together we can pray for peace to the one acquainted with my grief. He's talking about Jesus. The one acquainted with our grief. The one who understands our pain. The one who will help us heal and someday make things okay. Someday, somehow, we'll be okay, but not right now. Jesus comes to us even in those moments, even in our difficulty, even in our grief, even in our darkest hour, and he brings fresh hope. He gives power to the faint, and he strengthens those who are about to fall away. He calms us in the storm. He loves us, and he calls us by name. Jesus brings renewal. Um, as part of the Christmas Advent readings, we always consider the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Um, you know them. Zechariah was a priest. Elizabeth was his wife of many years. This is a New Testament story. But uh, she had never had children, and it was a heartache for both of them. Here are these verses from the first chapter of Luke. Both Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both of them were getting on in years. I wonder sometimes, how did they manage to stay faithful after such a heart-rending disappointment? They, ha they wanted children and they never had them. How did they remain faithful to God? Verse 8, once when Zechariah was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter into the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense burning, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. I'll tell you one of the ways they did it, they continued to serve God. They continued to go about their duties. Uh, they were Jewish people, they had faith in God, and they continued to live that faith out. They didn't give up on God just because their circumstances were difficult. They continued to act in faith. They did not equate unanswered prayer with God's displeasure or lack of interest in them. I'm going to say that again because this is important, okay? They did not equate unanswered prayer, God didn't give us what we wanted, with God's displeasure or lack of interest in their lives. That's maturity, isn't it? Just because God said no to a prayer, just because God didn't answer that one the way I wanted, it doesn't mean that God is upset with me. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care about me. They knew that. And so they continued about their business. He continued to serve as a priest. You know, I don't know why. I don't know why we don't have children, honey. I'm sorry but I got to go to church. <laughs> Come with me. That's great. That's beautiful. They continued to act in faith. Somehow, um, they were renewed day by day for the life God had for them. They were renewed through prayer. They were renewed through corporate worship. They were renewed through companionship and friendship with other faithful people. Maybe they read good books or listened to good music, but all of these things enabled their faith to be renewed each day. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning, the psalmist wrote, right? You don't get everything you want in life. It's okay. Sometimes you cry yourself to sleep, but you know what? God refreshes us. And morning by morning, his mercies are new. And you and I just have to keep walking. Keep walking in faith. It is the way of the faithful those who have grown in enough faith and wisdom to know better than to equate unanswered prayer with divine absence in their life. So on they went. Look at verse 11. 
Then there appeared an angel uh, to Zechariah, an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before them to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is great. This child's got quite a future, right? A lot of potential there. Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. Seems a, a little unrealistic. Thank you very much. Zechariah said, uh, let's see, the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you do not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. <laughs> when he did come out, he could not speak to them, and finally, eventually, they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. Well, something happened in there. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Even through the difficult experience of unanswered prayer and not having the families that their hearts longed for, Elizabeth and Zechariah managed to keep walking close to the Lord. And the Lord, in time, rekindled their faith daily and eventually even renewed their hope for a family. Verse 24, After those days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace that I have endured among my people. They went on to have a son, and they named him John, and he would eventually grow to be John the Baptizer. That's another story, but this is news. Oh, uh, back to my friends who had the house fire. They did rebuild their home. Uh, and this time they built a, a beautiful log cabin of their own design. And, and things were okay. They were better than okay, eventually. They were good again. It, it didn't happen overnight or even very quickly. As with any building, there are delays. But, but it happened. And, and Jesus came and brought strength to their weary souls. And Jesus brought renewal and hope for better days. So what about you? Do you feel stretched thin this season? Are you winded, exhausted, worn down these days? Perhaps you're even close to the breaking point. So what do you do? What is the solution? Isaiah counsels that with the Lord's strength, you can soar like an eagle. But weary people are often difficult people. Uh, because they're, they're kind of hard to convince, you know. We are more accustomed to living in despair and, and complaining and blaming others. What's that old proverb? It's hard to soar like an eagle when you're surrounded by turkeys. When we get weary, we don't think straight, and we don't see clearly. We can be difficult. That struggle is one aspect of the sinner and saint paradox in every Christian, we all struggle. Um, are we going to follow God? Or are we going to give in to the despair? We have the seeds of both goodness and evil within us. So we struggle between weariness and refreshment, between despairing and having hope in the Lord. We struggle between sinking into negativity or being refreshed and rising to the challenge and being strong in the Lord. How do we win? Just turn to Jesus 
and let it all out. That's what Isaiah counsels. Um, look at this uh, picture of a sculpture. At the front of some churches, there's a replica of a sculpture done by the Danish artist Bertel Thorvaldsen. It's titled Christus Consolator, Christ the Consoler. The statue sits in the National Cathedral of Denmark. The extended hands of the often life-size Christ figure are scarred by crucifixion nails. And standing before this image of Jesus, one can hear the echo of his invitation in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Isn't that beautiful? Can't you just imagine Jesus saying that? Right? Come to me, all of you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Rest for the weary. Strength for the faint. Isn't our Lord Jesus wonderful? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, be born in us today, bringing renewal. As you fill us with your strength, may yonder break a new and glorious morn. Amen. At this time, I'll invite the ushers to come forward who are going to help with Holy Communion. Yeah, just, just stand right there. Perfect, perfect. Um, the Sacrament of Communion in the United Methodist Church is an open sacrament. And what that means is that we don't ask where your church membership is. You don't have to be a member here in order to receive communion. What we do ask is that you have a sense of your own sin and your need for the grace and forgiveness that Christ offers. If you would like to receive communion, you are welcome to. Would you join me in the words of the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send empty away. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. And so by the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you, O God, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here, O God, and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
please rise for our closing hymn. The first Noel, 245.
children, we've got uh, Advent cards for you, the little Advent calendar and a Christmas card and a candy cane. And they're up here on the front pew with your names on them. So if you're under 18, come get a card. 